My name is Evan Meyer, and you're listening to the Undomesticate Podcast, a show where we explore how to deprogram domestication, restore the health of our body, mind, and spirit, and return to our sovereign roots. All right, folks, here we are on the Undomesticate podcast, and I'm really excited today uh, to be talking to Daniel Vitalis. Uh, Daniel is someone, and he may not know this because we literally just met 30 seconds ago, but he's someone that's been a huge influence for me about the last eight years. Uh, and I'll give a bit of context, Daniel, and maybe you can riff on this a little bit, but uh, I do want to start just by sharing some gratitude, honestly, for you and for the work that you've done. And the reason I want to share that is because I was in, in Colombia in 2015 and this little town called Mika. I don't know if you've ever been that way, but kind of overlooking the Colombian coast. Super beautiful uh, spot. And I was up helping construct this little eco village up in the mountains. And I was doing about seven or eight months. I'd been in, in uh, South America for about seven or eight months at that point. And we were off grid and there's a bunch of people from all over the world kind of contributing to this little dream that this guy had up in the mountains there. And one of the things that he had there was this beautiful running stream of spring water that came right through the property. And I had been thinking a lot about how I consumed water and where my water came from and all these kind of things in the last year and had been going through a pretty big awakening around, you know, food and nutrition and, and livelihood and domestication and all that kind of stuff. And while we were there, this woman brought up to me. She's like, have you ever heard of this guy, Dan Quetalis? And I was like, no. She's like, well, when you get back on the grid, you know, I recommend you download his podcast and, and check it out, rewild yourself. And so when I got back to Canada, because I, I, uh, I was doing a job where I was delivering little plants uh, around to different nurseries all summer. And I was driving in this box truck and you're, I literally went through every single episode that you had <laughs> that summer. And, it changed, it literally changed my life. Like it, it was, it was then that I, I moved back out to British Columbia. I was in central Canada, I moved to BC and I started foraging for mushrooms. I started gathering spring water, you know, and then it just started to escalate and, you know, foraging wild foods, everything. Uh, and it culminated into last year. I went on this 28 day primitive survival course with boss. I don't think you've ever heard of them. Boulder outdoor survival school. They oh, do all yeah, primitive skills. You know, a lot of the guys from alone, uh, came to that school of instructors, uh, you know, did that last year. And there's a whole other backstory, but just kind of this culmination of of skills and interest. I was going to winter count. I started going to all this primitive skills gathering. And really the genesis of that, seriously, was like your work. Like uh, there was always an inkling towards that, but I think it really pushed me over the edge to really start exploring my natural world. And and one of the things that always stuck with me is you know, had this kind of analogy of how we dress up like uh astronauts you know when we enter the world when we enter the natural world and we stay on the paths that are cut out for us and leave no trace and don't touch anything and like anything every mushroom was poisonous and everything could hurt you uh and then starting to develop this reciprocal uh relationship with nature and and how can i contribute to nature and how can i actually take from her ethically but then also how can i be of place like know my species know the things around me be able to name a plant and a tree and what was so fascinating was as soon as I started getting into culinary and medicinal mushrooms, like when I ventured out into the world, my whole perception changed. Like the way I looked at the world changed because not only was I, I wasn't just walking through the space anymore, but I was actually identifying things. You know, I was looking for a particular type of little bioregion for a particular mushroom. And I was looking for a particular tree so I could find, you know, rishis and all this kind of stuff. And it really just changed the way that I perceived the world in such a profound and impactful way. So I just, I just want to express my gratitude just first off here for the work that you've done. And I've been watching Wild Fed just this past week. I, I have to admit, I hadn't really watched much of it before. And just preparing for this interview, I was just amazed at what you've been able to create, especially, you know, in this, this last season. It really feels to me, and this is my own personal opinion, that you've kind of brought everything together kind of culminate to this thing where you're doing the foraging, you're, you're doing the hunting, um, you know, you're, you're talking, you're cooking, you're talking about food and the show has, I've never been to hunting shows and, and I'm a late kind of stage hunter myself. Um, 
but the way that you approach it and your team and how you how you produce it, it's so it's educational, it's entertaining, and it's really that like heartfelt. Like I really feel like the the connection and the heart and the the breadth of everything that you do, uh, kind of all your work culminated to this point. I don't know if that's true for you or not, but that's really what it feels like. Uh, and your passion is just like enthused, like throughout it. It's just infused with your your love of of nature and life and and this journey that you're on and with such humility. So. I just want to, I know that's a lot. It just gave you a lot there, man. But I just want to express my gratitude. If you have literally been one of the biggest influences uh, on my path and, and really changed my life. Thank you, Evan. Uh, that's, I really appreciate that. And I really receive it too. Um, yeah, I've got to do a lot of projects over the years. I've approached my work, I think a little bit more like maybe how a musician thinks of themselves and, and that they produce albums versus typical influencers, which have this, you know, they typically stick to their brand and they just keep that thing rocking forever. Um, and I've, I've kind of, I've kind of come through with these different projects. So, you know, my very first project was called Elixir Craft and that was <laughs> me with my blender, like making, you know, medicinal smoothies, teaching people how to incorporate herbalism and food together. And then, you know, I went on, uh, to do wild fed, which, oh, actually then Sir Thrival, which is, you know, 15 years later, still a, a really powerful supplement company and, you know, produce amazing products. I'm so excited about that too. And then, you know, getting to do Rewild Yourself, which I think went about 175 episodes with that podcast. And that one really did have um, a lot of impact. I get, you know, that's, we ended that podcast years ago, but I still get a lot of messages from people who are just finding it. So the archive is still out there for anybody who wants to check that out. I did the Wild Fed podcast, which I've also now wrapped about 175 episodes of that, which is a much more uh, focused on hunting, fishing, foraging, and food. Um, and right now I'm in the fourth season of wild fed, the TV show. So it's been pretty awesome. And I appreciate, oh, and find a spring.com I did during all that too, uh, which I no yeah. longer, you know, that's no longer my project. I've passed that on, but you know, these projects have all been, I've all, if you know my work well, Evan, you've heard me say it before, but I always think of these things as Trojan horses to bring people into the natural world because obviously we're standing at a really unique crossroads. I think in the last six months, more obviously than ever with the conversation about AI as that's become such a forefront conversation, I guess, in the media environment. And sort of like, I guess it's probably about 2015 when the first iPhones came out. Yep. I remember just before that, and because my friend was like, oh yeah, you know, I, we, we had like, everybody had these little cameras, you know, these little digital cameras. Yep. And I remember somebody saying, hey, pretty soon your phone's going to be your camera and you're going to have this and it's going to do that. And, and it was like, really? And then I remember that came out in the world has never been the same. And I think we're on the precipice of another radical shift like that with AI. I don't think people can fully perceive, just like I couldn't fully perceive what the iPhone would be. Like at that time, I got it was going to have a camera and it was going to be a phone and I could text. I had no idea there would be these things called apps, right? That would allow your phone to do almost any imaginable thing and how that would become so infused throughout our entire life I don't think we fully can even imagine yet what AI is going to be. But one thing we know for sure is it's going to deepen the divide between human beings and the planet that we live on. Mm -hmm. And so more than ever, whatever it is that gets people to have a relationship with nature, it could be hunting, it could be fishing, it could be foraging, it could be spring water, it could be movement in the outdoors or hiking or whatever, camping, whatever it is. This is a really important time because human beings are going to go into that digital space at a greater level than ever before. And uh, I think personally, if we don't keep a foot in the natural world, um, I don't think it's going to be a very pretty the outcome for humans. What is your prognosis? What do you think is going to happen? You know, I, I mean, the older I get, because I'll, be I'll be 45 this fall. So perspective, man. Uh, you know, the hindsight I have now... I don't know that I can prognosticate effectively, but I mean, and you know, I think our science fiction always points to the worst possible outcome and it never is that, right? So, you know, you remember like uh, those 1950s robot movies where it was like, you know, invasion of the robots or whatever. It's like, you know, we have, we have robotics and they mostly make cars and stuff, right? It's like, it's never, you know, AI is not going to be like Terminator robots running around like Skynet or I don't think it's that. But I do think that in the way that most people have become, myself included, like 
massively addicted to our devices. I mean, just a straight addicted, mm-hmm. right? Like it's, there's no other word for it. I mean, I've been addicted to things in the past. You know, I grew up smoking cigarettes. Like I, I you know, I know what addiction feels like. And yeah. I live in the kind of epicenter of a lot of fentanyl addiction. I mean, I know what it looks like. My brother runs sober houses. He's a former addict himself and um, very involved in those programs. Like it's nothing compared to how, what people are like with their devices. Absolutely. That's become almost an extension. Maybe, maybe it's fair to say that in some ways we're kind of like cyborgs now and that we have externalized part of our brain and our computing power because it's really hard to, under, it's really hard to overstate the, the degree to which these phones augment our, our brains. So as we head into what will be visual augmentation as well, an audio augmentation, and we start to integrate into a digital space. So, you know, you think of the trajectory of human beings in the last 300,000 years, we go from the wild environment to the domesticated agricultural or pastoral environment Mm -hmm. from that into, you know, the built environment where we're at now and then into the digital space. That's we just have a, you're just starting to touch that. Like people aren't really, you know, I don't go to meetings where people are wearing a VR headset and we all yeah. think we're in Paris or something. I haven't experienced <laughs> that yet, but that is right on the horizon, right? Okay, so, see. so I think that, um, right now you were just talking about going into nature and recognizing things. It's like, that's a really powerful space to be in, particularly when you get past going into the woods, trying to identify things. It's so interesting to me when you're at that point that you just know the things like, um, in the way that you go to your family reunion and you just, you don't like go in trying to identify who's who you're just like, no, that's grandma. That's my uncle. That's my third cousin or whatever. When you're in nature and you're like, oh, that's a maple and that's an oak and that's, you know, an amanita or whatever you're seeing. That's like the community of life and you're part of it. But as you and I know, there's a lot standing between people and that level of connectedness to their environment. So, Right now, most people are at that, what I always call that wall of green, where it's just, it's just this, like, like to most people, it's a thing that either is, is there at the outskirts of civilization in the dangerous place, or it's like a thing to be cut down so that you can develop more condos or strip malls, parking lots, or it's a stage upon which somebody does their sport or activity or recreation, recreation. So, but it's very rarely a community that they see themselves as interrelated with because they live on that landscape too. And they're one more organism. So the, the one thing I can prognosticate is that that gulf between people in that wild environment that they live on top of, but insulated from by the built environment, that gulf's going to grow. And it's going to grow precipitously because it's amazing to me, just time is such a, a, it's amazing perspective, you know? The, my generation is Gen X. We're like the forgotten generation. And, you know, we're going to, I'll be 45. So we're we're starting to age out. And I'm pretty close to the millennials. Millennials are coming in, Gen Z right behind them. They have such they are so digitized and also physically not fit, right? So those folks are going to, that they're going to be, you imagine like, I was talking to my wife about this the other day. My mother-in-law is 80 and she grew, and I have another friend in this late seventies I'm close to. And these people grew up on farms, not be, they, that's just how most people grew up. They just grew up on farms They grew up eating real food, doing real labor in real environments with real people enmeshed in real communities with real relationships and real consequences. Mm -hmm. So in their 80s, they carry the dowry of health that was built in those early years into their marginal decade, their last decade. Right. Some compound kind of interest there a little bit. Yeah, they built that. Like no one can take that from you. Yeah. But if you were born 
kind of, I, I picture sometimes, you ever eat lobster? I'm from Maine, so we, we yeah, eat lobster. Of course, I the Top Scotia for now. Okay. Yeah. You know when you take the meat out of a lobster's claw, that like jiggly texture that it has? That's how I picture yeah. the body mass of like a lot of young people today. They're like built oh. like that. If they're not athletic, if they haven't been athletic or pushed into athleticism, then they're not, they don't have that foundational structure. You know. So they're going to carry that forward. The thing is, is after your 20s, every decade, right, you're kind of getting fatter, losing muscle mass, losing bone density, losing cardiorespiratory fitness, like all that stuff starts to decline. So they're not starting from where the silent generation was starting from. They're not even starting from where the boomers or the Xers or the millennials started from, it's even more processed food. It's even less movement. It's more sitting. It's more computer integration. So that generation is going to come into, I guess, power in the world. You know, they're going to, in the sense of taking on the responsibilities of the world, unknown to me. I can't even imagine what's going to happen. Yeah. And, 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 and to that point, there's almost, not only is like, you know, the polarity of that, there's almost like a biological regression with people actually getting ailments in, in the neck, in the, in the hands, in the th- like the, the curling in of our bodies and, and uh, the, the constant use. It's, it's, you know, to your point, 300,000 years of, of evolution as a human. And then in, in 10 or 15 years, we have seemingly begin to restructure the way that our body is even held, like yeah. in time and space, you know what I mean? It's just pretty... It, well, it's terrifying in some regards, right? And and it's all these people know. Like I, I remember reading a statistic recently about the I think the average teenage girl spending six to eight hours on her phone per day, per day. Yeah. And then yeah. and then the 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 like kind of how coherent that is with the rates of anxiety and depression, and social isolation. Like they they track, you know, it's almost like every additional minute you spend on social media, you you there's some X factor that's multiplied your chances of depression or anxiety. Um, and for me, like, you know, I, I'm a 33, so I grew up kind of on the cusp, like I, I'm, I'm on the younger side of millennials. Um, and, and I can't millennial. <clears throat> what you're like one of the last millennials. I think I am the last year is 89 or yeah. 90 or something yeah. around there. Yeah. And, but I still do remember distinctly, like all the way up until, you know, I went to college about halfway through college is when iPhones really, you know, it was around 2010, I think, where they really started. They got a little bit of traction. Did you grow up, was there internet as far back as you remember? So my dad, yeah, he was, he worked from, he was like one of the first people that worked from home in like 94, but it was DOS-based internet. There was a program <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. called G. It was That useless. big startup sound thing that computers yeah, would make when you go on, I, log on. Exactly. I, I think, um, I think around <laughs> when I was seven, we had Internet Explorer or whatever it was at, at school. And that was kind of my first foray to internet. So I definitely grew up, you know, I grew up playing a lot of game, video games and, and grew up in the internet culture for sure. But I, to your point around people that grew up in farm, you know, my, my lineage comes from a farm. I didn't grow up on a farm. I grew up in an urban environment. My parents were nine to fivers, but, you know, uh, only a generation or two back. And, and it was, you know, agricultural living, new immigrants to Canada from Europe. And I always kind of felt like that's something I really wanted to do. And it wasn't until I was about 27 that I was like, you know, I was working pretty, pretty typical job. I was kind of working in the tech industry and had done, but done a bunch of different things before then. But I just said, fuck this. Cause I knew there was like, it was, it was doing something to me that wasn't good. You know, it was kind of coincided with all the, the stuff I spoke to initially about getting into your work and rewilding and all this kind of stuff. And I went and I worked on a biodynamic farm for two years. And uh, it was awesome. You know, I, I was super into Steiner. I loved what we were doing, small scale, but like all, you know, six acres of vegetables up in just north of Toronto in a place called Orangeville. You know, yeah, I've been there. <laughs> I've given, yeah. I've done talks there. You've been up there? Yeah. So you know yeah, the yeah. place. Yeah. So Morfield was yeah. the town that we were in, a really small place, but on like, you know, 40 acres of idyllic land. And I was, it, I honestly think that it's something that every single person should do for a season, even if you did it for yeah, a season. Did you hear uh, Robert Kennedy Jr. talking about this recently? I don't know if you I saw that, but, but he was talking about, I think he, they threw them the question of, of how he would handle the addiction problem in the United States. And he said, I would tax cannabis and then I would use that money to create work camps that were organic farm based where people recovering from addiction could go grow their own food and live in nature while they recover. And I was like, yeah. oh my God, like, 
Uh, please, can we have that program? That sounds really wonderful. You know, I agree. Absolutely. I think that if people could get, or like the primitive skills immersion, you know, mm -hmm. I've got a friend, Dan Doty, who uh, worked with media for a long time. Yep. And that's what he ran. He did um, long-term backcountry primitive skills immersions with kids who had reached the sort of end of the line disciplinarily at school and were being sort of sent out for this last chance kind of thing. And mm -hmm. I mean, as you can imagine, the turnaround stories from resistance to acceptance to full embrace that would happen over the arc of this, you know, it's just powerful to me what can happen. I know, I'm sorry to cut you off there, but like, I, no. I think it's so important that no, that people have uh, some connection to the natural world. It's the source. You know what I mean? It's like, I guess for a young person, I would say it's like at the end of the day, if you don't plug your phone in, your phone dies. It's like if you don't plug in to the source and the source is clearly in the natural world and not in anything built by people, nothing built by people can replace that. Yeah. Yeah, of course. And, and it's, it's kind of hilarious. It makes me think of all the the biohacks or like the things that we do that's just like shit that you would do in nature anyway. It's kind of been rebranded as this thing that's, oh, we're going to go, you know, forest bathing. We're going to go get in cold water. We're going to go yeah. do all these types of things. We're trying to recreate the natural environment in like a hyper synthesized synthetic kind of world yeah. where, where the obvious solution would to be just to actually go in nature. Yeah. You know, and, and, and I think to your point, like so many of those ailments are to what Robert Kennedy was saying, uh, just, just the immense amount of healing that happens. Like when I was working on that farm, I didn't go there to be healed, but like healing just naturally happens. Uh, and I'm talking on a soul level, on a biological level, on an emotional level, on all levels, naturally waking up with the sun every morning and, go, you know, your circadian rhythm gets locked in. Uh, just getting your hands in the soil, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And the same with this boss course. In fact, boss, that survival school was started by uh, a professor up in Provo, Utah, who noticed that all his students, like a lot of his students were struggling and failing out. And so he had this, he was an intermittent skills already. And he had this intuition. It's like, well, why don't I, they get a credit and they come for 30 days in the back country and we'll see how it goes. And all of them came back, lives completely changed. Whether they decided to stay in school or not, it doesn't matter. They got the clarity, you know what I mean? They got, they got everything that they needed, the nourishment that they needed, the clarity that they needed, the connection that they needed with themselves and with the natural environment. Uh, and it ran extremely successful about 30 years through that university and he privatized it because of litigation issues and stuff like that as you know we got to the 80s and stuff things became a little more risky to do stuff like that but i mean it runs to this day right and yeah. and it's i've done a lot like like you i've done all the transformational work man i've drank ayahuasca i've lived in peru like you know i've done all the different types of ceremonies and, and men's work and all this kind of stuff and i will say that course there it was absolutely the most profound experience that I'd ever had being out there, you know, away from light, you know, uh, building our own tools, building our own bow drills, fire kits, we slaughtered an animal, we use like every part of the body that it, it's kind of like people are, are always trying to find like, okay, I got on the morning routine and do my meditation, do this, that, and the other, and I'll stack my day so I can feel really good. And like, none of that is necessary when you're in nature because you already are present. Like there, there's nothing else to be once you really disconnect and you can be up there for a little while, like you don't, you kind of can let go of all the stuff that what I see as personally, we're really efforting to return to that, that connection with nature, like the level of nervous system relaxation that I had out there, just how calm I felt, how much presence I felt, how much connection. And the, they don't facilitate any type of spiritual journey on this. It's strictly skills. Yeah. Implicit. Yeah, spirit is just infused in everything that you do. Yeah. Then the longer you spend out there, you know, I didn't want to come home. Like I was just, no, I'm getting that. I'm like, and we had no tension. That's, a, that's the interesting that. challenge about it because clearly you and I are sitting inside right now. And the, the world is such now to go live that life is very difficult for several reasons, as you know. One is I think that it would be very difficult for my dogs to go live with wolves. And I'm not really cut for it anymore. I mean, I come from generations of people who've lived an urbanized life, you know? So there's that. And then there's the economic reasons, right? We're sort of all caught up in this massive economic model. 
So that's another reason. Um, the There's only a small number of people, deep, true believers who are going to live that life. And I, I want to say, and I think probably most of the people who listen to your show are probably going to be true believers anyway, but for those who aren't, I just want to say like doing that is enough and bringing it back with you. Like not everybody has to go live that life fully mm -hmm. in order, but you're right. So you come back and you start stacking the behaviors, dude, I'm, I'm deep in that, I'm <laughs> deep in that game. You know, I run a spreadsheet of the things I try to do every day yeah. in order to just replicate the things that happen on the days that I'm really out. Yeah. But I want to bring the upside too, because I'm a balancer and you and I agree on this. So I'll, I'll bring the balance to it. A lion in the zoo will live to 30 years old and a lion in the wild will live to 15. And the lion in the zoo is given up a lot. It's given up a lot. If you could ask the lion which it would prefer, I think it would take 15 years of the wild, no question. But, um, Rather than a surrogate form of replicated behaviors in a zoo made out of, you know, with a habitat made out of paper mache or whatever. It's like, it's all fake, you know? <laughs> but <clears throat> for us today, if I can not only live to 90, but I can do it with joints that still work, if I can still squat, if I can still carry, if I can still play and laugh and run and be healthy. Mm -hmm. And I can have, in other words, if I can have the robust qualities that rewilding gives you, but I can get the longevity that domestication gives you, then I think that's one of the better outcomes because we... You know, hunting and gathering and doing my television show has been a really powerful lesson for me. So I've spent the last eight years pretty deep in that. You know, mm -hmm. out of Rewild, right at the end of Rewild Yourself, I was like, I'm going for this, you know? Because I'd been talking about it philosophically and biohacking it as much as possible. But I was like, I'm gonna really do the food thing. But what I know now is how that's barely possible. You can do it, but it's barely possible. The <laughs> land where the best plants grow is also where people want to live, right? So there's not a lot of open space where natural plant communities can live and thrive and you can forage. Hunting is still widely accessible in the United States, but highly, highly regulated. Okay, and right. yeah. we don't have the ability to just I mean, maybe if you go to Alaska, but let's face it, Alaska is not a place where a tribe of hunter-gatherers want to live. There's no food, really. It's like you want to live in these riparian zones, right? You want to live where there's like temperate zones with flowing water and floodplains. Like that's where, unfortunately, all the cities are. So it's not like we can go back to this and it'd be, as you know, too, when you try to pull like, hey, well, let's all go live together as a community. This is like a, it doesn't really work very well. So we can't kind of like return to it. So we've got, we're here we are, we're living in this built environment. We need to be effective in there or else we'll fail to thrive, right? So fitness is your ability, right? To, to, to thrive in your environment. So I want to be fit for the built environment. I want to be fit for the wild environment. I also want to be fit for the digital environment because I don't want to get left behind and crushed by that juggernaut either. I need to know how to make money in order to have the resources I need in order to continue to live the life I want to live in this coming world. I don't want to do that at the expense of my ability to go into the wild or into the built environment either. I want like all three of those things because, and I want to sort of be at the center of the Venn diagram of those things. So there's so many, it's easy to identify the problems with our domesticated life, but there are some benefits Massive benefits too. Right. One probably being that, you know, you don't deal with the threat of interpersonal violence regularly, which is awesome because I'm not a big guy. So, you know, I get my skull bashed in, in the old world. You know what I mean? Pretty fast. Yeah. Like, yeah. like, it's nice that I don't have to think about that on the day to day. You know, it's nice that like we have trauma medicine today and it's nice that I can have. So the thing is, is what's interesting to me about it is domesticated life prevents all this wear and tear because nature's rough and tumble. So you don't, 
you don't get a busted leg and like your life's kind of over. You don't get like the threat of violence constantly, infection constantly, irregularities in food, all, all those kind of things that happen in the wild environment. So you're like preserved kind of like the way, like, you know, that people, when people are super stoked, cause they're like, yeah, I bought a car off an old lady who'd been in her garage since she bought it. And she's only driven it like three miles a week for the last 10 years. That's yeah. like our bodies, right? The problem is under those conditions, we degenerate. Yeah. So without, without all of those rough and tumble things, our bodies are go fall apart. So it's like, we need all those stresses. We need hot and cold. We need to get our shoes off. We need to like deal with the stresses that we no longer have. We need to like subject ourselves to all of this hardship in order to make ourselves strong. And you know, that's the, the hormetic kind of lifestyle. Yeah. You know, we, have to, we have to pick our challenges because and, we don't and, limit this. And be challenge. diligent, dude. Like, as you know, diligent, because it's so easy to take it easy. Okay. So that's our problem is like, how do I subject myself to this stuff consistently enough over time that it builds the robust wild health, develops the connection to the natural world, but doesn't disadvantage me in the world. Cause that's what I found personally in my forays into the primitive skills world is I meet a lot of people who have gotten so cool. unadapted to the world we actually do live in Absolutely that right. they're marginalized by it. And so I bring that up. Um, you and I already agree and know about all of the rewilding component, right? Like that, we get that. So Whatever. that's the piece I feel to say is that we have to be careful not to disadvantage ourselves moving forward because also part of this is sharing it with other people. Really? And I have found that the worst way to try to convince a normie about this stuff is to show up in buckskins with no with dirty feet yeah. trying to be like, no, this is the better life. And they're looking at you like, dude, you look like a primitive homeless person. Totally. And so that doesn't work either, right? That's like so deep down the rabbit hole. That's who you want when you show up at your primitive skills class. Of course. But you don't want yeah. that person showing up telling you how you should live when you're in the city, right? So, <laughs> so it's like knowing how to walk. I think the movie, The Matrix, is like a great, you see a great analogy. When they go into The Matrix, they look the part. But when they're not there, they also look the part. And I think that's important for us to know how to walk in all these worlds. I, yeah, I totally agree. And I, I, I feel like that's really tactical. I knew it was for me at the end of this, you know, that, and I'm just, because it's, it's kind of fresh in my mind, it was just less than a year ago. At the end of that kind of 28 day course that I did, right? I knew there was like an impending, like tomorrow I'm returning back to society and there is yeah. some trepidation, you know, and there is uh, some, some grief really. And there was some yeah. excitement, of course, like, oh my God, opening a fridge. You know, and like having a thing full of food, like for the first week I got back there, like the shit that I took for granted that I just yeah. have to take my whole life and, and most people ever will became a bed. Like, wow, this is fucking yeah. awesome. Like, yeah, I have, really obviously, nice. you know, I, we're, we're steep in this world. You make a show that takes an immense amount of production and, and digital assets and time and, and like very in this world. Travel you know, in hotel rooms, from those planes, everything that like yeah. you're not forced back to get to Molokai. No, no, you know? no, <laughs> like, unfortunately, like, not. Yeah, yeah. But there, it's for me. I I feel like I can walk that line, and I think that's really important. I think most people obviously are are are, are way uh, on the on the one side of just pure to me, like don't even have an awareness right. of what's available there. And I also right. think like people deep on that primitive skills, it's almost like larping a little bit. Like that's, that's not, my, that's for me. I mean, it's important LARPing because it needs yeah. to be preserved, but it, totally. there is something like it would make a great mockumentary, right? Of course. And, and I, and I come there with that. Like I'm, I'm not that kind of guy that shows up there and is like, needs all the buckskin and stuff, but I do appreciate the skills because I, yeah, of course they to speak to a part of, of mm -hmm. my ancestry. Like I feel it in my DNA, if that makes yeah. sense. I don't know if you can recognize that yeah, same way you take an animal. Like I remember the first few animals I took and like, by the second animal, I felt like, oh, this is, I've done this a thousand times mm -hmm. because I have in some regard, you know, like the, the thousands of generations before me, right? I have I've, I've used a blade or a stone tool or something to move it along these lines and everything just made sense. It, it, it came on very, very quickly. Now, I'm, I'm not amazing at it, but the, the essence of it, you know what I mean, yeah. came very fast because I think there's something there. 
But for me, and maybe I don't know if you have anything to say to this, but has it been hard for you, and maybe in the past and not so much more, be a little older than me, to kind of reconcile that, like, kind of want to be more an emotional level than, than a tactical level of like, fuck, like, I don't know, it's easy for me to get, I would say depressed, that's a bit of a heavy word, but feel the grief from the weight of where life is going and just like feeling all of that. And not necessarily that I need to reject society and move into the bush, but I'm sure that you've had these experiences out in nature where you're like, this is it. Like this is the pinnacle of existence almost. And, and, and how to reconcile with that emotionally sometimes where it's like, yes, I, I am using all these technologies and I am making money online and doing all these things that are like really great. Having a house to come into with climate control and a car that gets me around is awesome. But I also carry this like, there's like a bit of a sadness maybe, and maybe it's just a maturity thing, but kind of just like, damn, if only people knew, right? If only people knew like, like, yes, this is all nice, but so much of it's unnecessary. And, and, it, and it, even myself, I, I, like you said earlier, I find myself getting caught up in my own addictions and coming back from being in the bush and then not wanting to touch my phone. And then within a few weeks, just like right back into it. Right. And kind of like, fuck, really? I'm just another I'm, I'm another one of these, like, you know what I mean? I'm just, I, I'm, I'm just as susceptible, no matter how much knowledge and connection I have, I'm just as susceptible to the, the entropy of, of kind of domestic life. And, and there's, for me, I carry a little bit of grief with that. I don't know if that's true for you or not. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Um, I think, uh, well, there's a lot there. One, I want to say regarding the addiction not just to, well, let's talk about the devices specifically. Well, no, go, we'll talk technology generally speaking. I mean, how addicted was the first hominin to um, a, a flake, a sharp flake of flint when they figured that out? Uh, like there was no going back. No. And I wonder, this is how I thought experiment this. I wonder if somebody else in the tribe was like, dude, you're so hooked on that piece of flint. You're, you're, it's like you're a cyborg now. You can't live without it. Like, remember these, what these are for, and like these are for, you know, and now you're just, you always have this piece of flint. And then it's like, oh, all the kids these days, now they're all using a piece of flint now. And then it's like, oh, you guys with your atlatls, you can't throw a spear anymore. Like, I remember when I was growing up, we threw spears with our arms, Right. And you can follow that all the way up to like, oh, the horse, you can't walk anymore. Oh, the printing press. We used to write everything by hand. You know what I mean? Like written word, like, oh, we used to tell stories and now you kids have to write them all down. You, you are a enmeshed in a, a flowing river of time space and an almost insignificant part of it. Right. It's like both of us are like insignificant grains of sand caught up in the torrent of time space. This is where we find ourselves. And it sounds like you've explored entheogenic medicines before. So you may have a sense of this. One of the things that they reveal, I think they reveal is I can't speak for women on this, but men in particular, we often have a Messiah complex. Mister. We, because we're programmed to go save the day, right? So young men in particular, when they have a calling, almost think that they can single-handedly go fix the world, solve the world's problems. I mean, that's kind of how I started this work. I was like, I'm going to solve the world's problems with this stuff, you know? Yeah. What you can do is identify the world's problems, Um, and you know, you can go chip away and make, maybe make a dent in it, but, but, um, there's, there's this sense of like, you're responsible somehow, not you, I'm not saying, I'm not trying to put myself in your position, just saying I can, I can have this sense of like, almost like I'm responsible for this by participating in it. But that, I don't know that that's a fair, there's so many things look, looking back at history, it's really easy to judge people who lived at different time periods where unethical things were happening. And, and you can, it's very easy to think like, why would they ever have been a part of that? And then you look at yourself today. Like, like when we hear about like, oh, um, that founding father of the United States was a slave owner. And it's like, mm-hmm. oh my God, it sounds so horrible. And then you're like, one day they're going to look back and be like, Daniel Vitalis was a car driver. And people yeah. are going to be like, oh, 
how what I'm not trying to compare the of course you know what people I as what saying, but, but what these I social is issues that, that we look yeah. at now there's a generation I that can. looks at fossil fuel as the most unethical thing you could be a part of and here we all are using it and and it'll it's really easy to judge in hindsight somebody's involvement not understanding how big the thing actually is so when we're talking about this stuff man we're talking about the whole world's caught up in this thing and we're just like individuals caught up in it so that's one piece when it comes to the phones i want to say that um an alien intelligence, an, al an alien super intelligence. Now, I'm not saying that our phones are aliens or created by aliens. That's not, not I don't, I'm talking extraterrestrial. I'm saying a non human super intelligence has been created that's been given the mandate to figure out how to hold as much of your attention as possible, as much of the day as possible, and even the night too, to steal as much of your peace. Is possible, and and not even nefariously, maybe, but probably not nefariously programmed for such. It's just that by taking your piece, it gets your attention. So the algorithm continues to improve, and that you're addicted to it is like if I started giving you little injections of heroin every day, you would become addicted to it probably, and there would be an argument for like, hey man. I wish you could stop, but like, it's understandable how you got here. And we've sort of, it's understandable because it's a super intelligence that's designed to get your attention. So I think we have to have a little compassion on ourselves in that regard. And then um, another aspect, I'll say two things that make this bearable for me is uh, my wife, my, my, my just organic loving relationship with my wife. That's like, if I didn't have that, I, I think I would be an ideologue and I would be, I find interviews like this, I'm a little trepidatious because when you're, when you're a true believer and you talk to another true believer, if you're not careful before you know it, you're coming up with crazy ideological things. And before you know it, you start thinking dudes should be competing with women as swimmers or something, right? Oh. It's like you end up with these crazy destinations where you're like, get here. <laughs> And you're, you're arguing for it. You're arguing for the sanity of something like that because you're so deep in your ideology that you can't see that you've become the mockery of your own idea. And we have to be careful about that. Um, mm -hmm. So my wife keeps me from doing that because mm -hmm. I'm susceptible to, to going too far with stuff like this. It's actually been, it's been, I've noticed that even in your work there, like, you know, over the years, there is, and I think that comes with, with maturity and aging. And I had said definitely with having, I, I'm married as well to a very, yeah, I, I totally understand where you are from. There's, there's a soft, it tempers you a lot. It tempers rigidity. you a lot. There's a soft, yeah. in the cause you have to be like with a founded yeah. being, you can't, there's just rigidity just doesn't work. She just yeah. can't, yeah. it's not shit and she'll poke it apart, but it just doesn't work. And it's great to have somebody who, um, appreciates it, but doesn't give a shit about the, like, how, you know, how far you can take it or how much you can do it. Or it's like, not why she loves me, you know? Yeah. So that, and then I think my relationship with my creator, that's because that gives me perspective that like, this isn't my, I didn't create this world. I didn't have anything to do with it. I just woke up one day. I was like three. I started having memories I don't know, just showed up here, just got here, you know, mm -hmm. not responsible for it. I try to, I'm try today to look at it almost like a video game. Let's say you're playing a video game, like your character, you don't start the video game where the character's born and then you have to sit in a crib for nine months and then, you know, you learn to walk. It's like you start sort of one day you just start going in the game, right? You're just playing. It's like, here I am just playing, man. The conditions are not my responsibility, but I have to respond to those conditions. Um, my, if I were to go live in the forest, I'm not going to really make a substantial impact on, let's say, the plastic problem. I mean, yes, I'm technically one less person using it, but that's not how we, we're getting out of this problem. Like, that's just, that would be so foolish to think that, right? And Absolutely. whether I use a roll of paper towels or a plastic bag, when you zoom out, it's like a thing happening at such huge scale at this moment in history, it kind of doesn't matter that much. 
What you know, matters is what we anchor into the consciousness moving forward. Like for an example, like think about having come through the COVID experience where during COVID, I noticed that there was a lot of news stories that came out that like you were, I'd read and I'd be like, that's not even true. That's not happening. Um, things are said that you're, you're like, why would anyone even write that? It's not true. Uh-huh. That what I realized is 50 years from now, that's all that remains, those articles. So people in 50 years, they're going to think what happened was as bad as the obnoxious articles you would read and stories you would see about how bad it was. When you were like, mm, was it that bad though? I don't think a lot of okay. that even really happened. I don't think that stuff really happened. Won't matter. You're gone. The articles remain. So it's yeah. written into the future in a sense. And so it, the things we record and the things we write, I think in some sense, and I know this is like anathema to, to hardcore environmental folks, but like I personally think what you drop into the new sphere of consciousness matters a little bit more than if you participate in plastic stuff. Another way to say that would be George Washington having slaves, while not okay, what he put into collective consciousness had such a great impact on freedom later, even though he was participating in something that took away freedom at the time, Mm -hmm. that he didn't create. He was just born into a world where that was a thing, and it wasn't just Africans. People were enslaved all over the world and had been all over the world. Slavery was just a thing people did forever. Including indigenous tribes, as far as I know as well. Slavery was like- Still happening now. All cultures, there's no idea culture that didn't, Participate right now, there are, are black Congolese folks who have enslaved pygmy folks at gunpoint and use them as laborers. Native yeah. American people own black slaves. Like This is a much more convoluted story than anyone yes. likes to really look at. But my point is, he was involved in something horrific, yeah. but he was also involved in something that later on turned into the greatest liberties for people that have ever existed, probably it- ever. I mean, that's one of the interesting things about where we are. In some ways, we're in this situation where it looks like, wow, we're losing liberties. Things are getting weirder by the day. But at another level, you're like, geez, has there ever been a moment out since the beginning of the agricultural revolution where people have had this level of freedom before? Probably not. So it's interesting. So my point is, right now, I think it's more important that you don't go live in the bush permanently. And instead you do what you're doing because that I think is going to impact the future more than if you just pull yourself out because it's real convenient to be like, well, I remove myself. I'm going to go meditate in the cave. And it's like, oh, aren't you noble? Hey, how about out here where the battle's being fought? Why don't you Mm -hmm. get out here and and actually get in it? Uh, So that's another hesitation I have. That said, I'm stoked that people do those things. Those things need to be preserved. We need people to do them. But when I look at like what I want to do with my life energy, I feel like I'm involved in a spiritual story that's unfolding in the world. And I just got to have faith in my creator. I got to have the relationship that keeps me on point and just keep doing my work every day um, and trust that's enough. Because the reality is like, like here's my, my lifespan in little squares, dude. And every week I check one of those off. Yeah. I'm headed to the grave, dude. I'm in the process like you. We're we're dying. I mean, it's just it's on, right? <laughs> so it's like no one gets out alive. So to me, I just got to keep chunking away at the work every day and have faith and stay positive cuz the other thing that sucks is when people are so ideological. This is what sucks about all of these kind of woke characters these days. There's like um they're so disgruntled that it's like, how can you be doing any good in the world when your attitude is so shitty and you make people feel shitty and then you're like, I'm making a better world. It's like, doesn't feel like you are. So like, we also have to be joyful. So that sadness, just to wrap a bow on all that, that sadness, which I understand exactly what you're talking about. And I think we could expand on that feeling. I mean, there's a lot to it. It's gotta be put in the right context because if we let that become a, a compass for us, it actually leads, I think, in the wrong direction. Yeah. So a clearer, yeah. higher vibe compass is really crucial. It's almost, it's almost selfish to a degree. You know what I mean? To like, just, <laughs> it's to, indulgent. Just, to, exactly. Just to indulge in the emotion, which is so funny because I think that's such a, there's almost like this crusade for that. I think that's where a lot of this wokeness comes from is because, you know, in this idea, ideologues and the idea, there's so much that you shared there, but the idea of 
tarnishing someone's entire contribution to society because of one hiccup that they made, where contextually, if we go 30,000 feet in the air, it actually was pretty inconsequential at the time, mm -hmm. right? Like it was, it would have been, it would have been exactly like you driving a car in comparison or whatever that we, I, I'm sure 50 years people will be like, they were on their phone all day right. and the right. people had the, it's wrong to come around. It's like lead paint, you know what I mean? And so yeah. the, <laughs> staying in the grief, of course is, yeah, it's a little bit of self-indulgent, but I also think, and, and maybe you agree with this, this is what I'm hearing from you, is it also is the muse to drive us to make an impact or to to live a life. Like, like grief drives me towards spirit or towards creator, right? Because there's like, well, I have to reconcile like, well, what is happening in life. I have to, it, it's it's sense making, right? And same with partnership, right? Like even even the, the ideology around what partnership looks like these days and the, the destruction of union and, and marriage, mm -hmm. And, and all that kind of stuff and how it actually, it further perpetuates our, this, the self-indulgent kind of part of humanity, but the, 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 the grief and the sadness. And, and so I actually really do understand why people jump onto these ideologies. I, I understand if I get really wide enough, like it makes sense that there's, there's real things that are really hurting people and they really stand by it, but how, what they do with that, to your point, determines like whether it actually raises the collective consciousness in a direction that's actually going to heal humanity or whether it's just divisive. And, and honestly, not only are those people bitter and, and not fun to be around or not pleasant, but they're just incredibly selfish. That's really yeah. what I know this most. Yeah. It's just incredibly so, selfish. Super sad. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, keep yeah. in mind though, too, you have, I was just listening to Jordan Peterson describe this recently. He was saying how there's like 3% of the population are sociopaths. Yeah. And uh, sometimes the number goes up a little and sometimes it goes down a little. And then if it gets too high, it's intolerable. And if yeah. it gets too low, we forget that they're there. Mm -hmm. And then it's, so it hovers around three. And he was saying in his opinion that these ideologies attract sociopaths because they can masquerade under the, like as if they're compassionate, but they can use, the, they can be sadistic and Weapon. hurtful under the guise of being compassionate to others, right? So they hurt you by saying they're protecting this group or that group or this group over here. So sometimes I don't think it's regular people that are the loud ones in there, you know? It's like, there's all the regular people who are just like, yeah, I'm trying to, I wanna support the right cause. And then you have these people pretending they do, because some of the stuff doesn't even make sense. And you're like, man, some stuff you're like, okay, I kind of see that. Some yeah. stuff you're like, that's an evil motherfucker right there. Why would they yeah. say that? You know, <laughs> so part of that is actually like straight up. I don't know if you call it evil, but like sociopathy, which is like yeah. pretty, pretty any social stuff. But um, yeah, anyway, um, ultimately I think we really have to find balance with this. Again, I, the relationship to the natural world to me, kind of non-negotiable. I'm one of those people, it's like I'm out walking and there's a stream and it's like, I want to take my shoes off and just put my feet in there. You know, like <laughs> I, I see something and I like want to eat it. You know, like I look at a natural environment, I like want to taste it, you know? So I like, I viscerally want to be part of the natural world. I just, um, I'm past the point of, as you know, if you've watched the arc of my work, I was like, you know, a crusader for it before. And now I'm trying, I'm a much more, I think I have a much more balanced view of it. And also, I just think if I'm not happy, then I'm actually not helping. Absolutely. And, you know, you talked about grief. Like, here's something interesting I learned when I was younger. Um, I started, you know, I grew up with a lot of childhood pain. And so I, I carry grief, you know, a, a good amount of it. And I was going to a church for a while <clears throat> in my teens. And uh, every Sunday at the end of the sermon, they would kind of like call people up to the front for healing or to receive Jesus or anything like that. And I would come up to the front and I would cry. I would just get on my knees and I would cry. And I would cry for like a long ass time. And then every week I would do it. And, and after a while I was like, where's, what's the, where's the end of this well? Okay. And then I realized, oh, there's no end to this well. This is the emotion grief. And if I go into that emotion of which it's, it's endless, Right. Just like my happiness is endless. So when I tap into my happiness, 
I don't feel like, oh, I'm going to use this up. It's a fuel. I better be careful how I spend my happiness because it's almost gone. It's actually endless, as is my love, as is my sadness, as is my anger and, yeah. and righteous fury too. Like some of these things we've been talking about don't just make me feel grief or sadness, bro. Oh, I have yeah. like righteous indignation sometimes where I'm yeah. like, I'm like, I understand the desire to just burn it all down and start it over, you know? So these emotions are sort of, they, I don't know what they are, but they pre-exist you and me. They're there. You know what I mean? Like, like you and me die, grief still there. So it's like a God. Like, you know, into you almost, you know what I mean? And yes, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So I saw, um, I was watching a really great documentary uh, about um, Iliad Kipchoge, the marathon runner, very cool documentary. And um, there was a, he lives in Kenya and there was a sign on the wall in I think his mom's house. And it says, uh, the key to happiness is to start being happy. And so yeah. there's simple wisdom there where it's like, you can just spend all day grieving if you want. You'll never run to the bottom of it and, or anger or, or happiness or whatever it is. So, but I find when I'm in my happiness, I'm the most effective I can be and the healthiest I can be. And when I go into my grief and my anger and my sadness, which I do a lot because I'm super fallible and I, I got all kinds of background trauma that it's easy, it's easy for me to go there. But, uh, but that's where I start to destroy things around myself. I start to uh, erode my relationships. I start to destroy my own work. I start to sabotage my relationships. It's, and I... I Right now, and this is why I feel so bad for these Gen Zers because they're they're being told, "Hey, the world's going to end in nine months because you're yeah. you know you have a Ziploc bag," and they believe that, and that anger, sadness, and fear is driving them to erode the good things that they have. That, like you coming back to the refrigerator, didn't know were good. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's, we have to. It, be- it, it, it inserts this in, almost like an entitlement in in some regards. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, there's just, there's such a, a disparity, but it's almost like such a disconnection from reality, really, because like, yeah, if you're force fed this news about how terrible person you, like your existence is terrible, essentially, yeah. like you're told you you're have no wrong. right to be here. Yeah. You don't really have a right to be here. And now like you're left with this mess that you can try and clean up, but inevitably you won't be able to. And like your children, if not you and your children's lives are Decimated. That's why you should end your genetic line by not having yeah, children, right? That's, that's the story. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's the world we're in. So, yeah. So I think that when we put all that stuff down and those influences aren't there, the truth starts to bubble to the surface like a spring. It just bubbles up. It's very hard to hear your inner voice. It's very hard to hear the voice of your creator when you are under all of that guilt, shame, and the technology is like up in your space. And so you go and do what you did there that you described. You know, I go away hunting, go hunting tonight, actually. Beautiful. It's like, ah, that stuff goes away. And I'm just a participant again in this incredible gift of life we've been given. Um, so a big part of this isn't really even that it's the nature part. It's that the nature is a gift you've been given yeah. to live this life. And there's a lot of forces that want to keep you from that. And, and some of those forces come from within us too. So we have to be really careful and vigilant um, and make sure that we, it's not just that we stay connected to nature, it's that nature is the source. And when we're connected to that, we're connected to the source and that's when we can operate correctly. Yeah, and, and you know, just, uh, and I know we're, we're winding down here because you've got about an hour, um, but to that point, I think if people saw that nature as a gift, like there would be no need to force feed people to buy carbon credits. And, you know, that's like getting a skin in the game where you're like, yeah. like, dude, you know, I grew up on Vancouver Island and you go out into, you go out to the, the west side of Vancouver Island and you look at those trees, there are those old growth trees. And like, you're like, like I'm getting used to just talking about it because there was no reason that you would just be in complete reverence of nature. Even the most, like disassociated, addicted person goes and they just see the, the, the width and the girth and the mass and you just look up at it and you know that thing's so ancient. That is what is going to save the planet from whatever ecological disaster that we're heading towards. You know what I mean? Um, having skin in the game and giving people those experiences and you only can receive that, in my opinion, 
uh, by getting out there, you know what I mean? And actually getting in connection with nature. That's, that's the antidote. It's certainly not, not flying on jets, you know? Um, the story is encoded in, in, in the story of the tower of Babel and human beings trying to build their way to the heavens yeah. instead of just experiencing the beautiful life they've been given. They feel, we feel we need to create something better than this. And something I've said so many times, I'm sure you've heard me say it, but it's like, well, and I think why those trees, by the way, that's a beautiful part of the world. I, I love that. I love Vancouver Island. I've had some amazing experiences there um, in nature um, that are very special to me. But um, when you see something that grand, it reminds you that you aren't the creator of things and people aren't, you know, we're surrounded when we're surrounded by everything around us was built by people and every living thing around us was domesticated by people. Then it starts to feel like people are who create and we get out of that and we see, Oh, the stuff we don't even know where it came from is so much better than anything we can create so much vaster, more complex and more organized. That's that higher power moment where it's like, Oh, there's a higher power here. It's not us. And that gives me the sense of comfort that regardless of what's going to happen to the world, whether we destroy it or we don't, we heal, it doesn't matter. I just show up and do my work. I know my creator's got this. There's, I just do the piece that's my piece. Um, there's an intelligence at work far beyond human intelligence. I, the bleakest idea would be that human intelligence is the greatest intelligence. That's scary stuff to me. You know, that kind of comes back to that sociopath piece. I think that would only inculcate more sociopathy in society and, yeah. and obviously rampant narcissism, which you clearly yeah. see. And we can Never dive heard. deep into that, Never but I, I know we're, we're next, on that. Next time. Next time. I'd, I'd love to come back and wrap with you again. I know you do most of your interviews in person, but uh, I I, I'd, love to, I'd love to do this again with you sometime. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, uh, Daniel. Like I said, this has been such a huge, I've been really excited and I just, I just really want to uh, send some gratitude for you to just take the time and coming on today. I know you're a busy guy. What are you hunting tonight? I'm way. hunting deer uh, on a, a farm that grows pumpkins and they <laughs> have nuisance tags. So normally here in Maine, you know, deer season's November. It's Whoa. a very difficult hunting season. Actually, we have a very difficult deer hunt in Maine and a very small herd, but I can really reliably get venison in my freezer uh, night hunting on this farm. So uh, it's for me, I, it's like one of my favorite uh, hunts that I do all year. So it's just opened back up. So I'll head out there tonight and hopefully come home with uh, a deer for me, my wife and my dogs. Yeah, that's incredible, man. Well, I wish you the best of luck. And uh, for people that are, you know, maybe not familiar with your work, why don't you just share where people can find you and kind of what you're yeah. up to. Yeah, well, probably the best place to connect with me is on Instagram at Daniel Vitalis. And, um, you know, my company is surthrival.com. So that's like survive and thrive. And, and we've got a pretty robust product offering there, including um, the first ever, uh, we have the America's indigenous protein powder. We have a 100% a hand foraged, wild harvested black walnut protein powder, which is just super cool to me. So anyway, so that's surthrival.com. Um, of course, on podcast platforms, any of them, you can find both Wild Fed and Rewild Yourself. So uh, about 300 episodes total in that, somewhere in that zone. And then uh, my TV show is on Outdoor Channel, Monday nights. Um, but you can also find it on Amazon Prime uh, or uh, myoutdoortv.com. So if you want to see, we're filming the fourth season now, so there's three seasons out. Uh, so, you know, the TV show is my most recent thing and the thing I'm kind of most excited about. So hope people go check that out for us. Yeah, thanks again. I highly recommend anybody check out Daniel's extensive catalog of work. You, you know, um, as well as survival. I'm a I'm a big pine pollen and colostrum fan, oh, so I got those products in the kitchen right now. Right on, uh, like super high quality stuff. And uh, yeah, thanks again, Daniel, for coming here. Everybody, thanks for listening. And uh, yeah, we'll catch you next time on the End Domesticate podcast. Thanks, Evan. Thank you.